<laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to showcase a local rabbi. We have Re Rabbi Karen Tomaschow, who is with us. She is the Associate Rabbi at Wise Temple. Did I get that right? Correct. Associate Rabbi. So some of you may be familiar with Rabbi Tomaschow because you either are a member of Wise Temple, have been to a Wise Temple events, or have otherwise seen her around Cincinnati. So according to her bio on the, the synagogue's website, she is originally from, you're going to have to help me pronounce this. I was going to say Worcester, Massachusetts. How do you pronounce <laughs> it? Um, well, I'll give you two pronunciations if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, Rabbi Karen Thomas Show is oh, sure. from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. Okay. Not to be confused with Worcester, Ohio. No, not to be confused with Worcester, Ohio. And one differentiation is you can say Wista, and you sound like you're from Boston, Boston, you know, Wista. Wow. Okay. That is nothing like Worcester. <laughs> no. we, I, had a, I, had a, I had someone recently who uh, spoke about uh, the history of Jewish communities in small towns in Ohio, and he is from Lancaster, but they pronounce it there as Lancaster. So it's- That's right, that's it's, right. It's a, different, it's a different local pronunciation for sure. So Thomas Show, not Thomas Show. That's right, yeah, like a show. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, that's the first sentence. <laughs> Hopefully I'll pronounce everything else. All right, so Rabbi Thomas Show attending college at Brandeis University. What, what's the mascot? The judges. Really? Because of Lewis. Yeah, because of Lewis D. Brandeis. It's actually an owl. <laughs> it's an owl who plays the like mascot. the judge. <laughs> wow. Okay. There's probably not a lot of uh, competition out there for other schools with the name of the judges. For Okay. That's <laughs> learn something new every day. All right. So she majored in sociology and minored in so social policy and NEDGES, Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. Rabbi Thomas Show earned her rabbinic ordination right here in Cincinnati at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, where she wrote her thesis entitled A Lily and an Apple, a History of Jewish Interpretation to the Song of Songs, which is really fascinating for me, which mm. I'm going to connect with you on after this. Please do. And she worked as a rabbinic intern for Wise Temple in 2006 through 2007 before the, the mortgage crisis. Yes, that is one way to put it. <laughs> that is such a vastly different era in America. All right. So wow. she joins us. She is a, as, as I mentioned, local rabbi. And we are discussing this week's tour portion of Bishalach. And it's very exciting because it's the, the, the Jews are leaving. They finally, they got permission to leave Egypt and they're heading out. And that is our opening scene. <laughs> and by right? the way, I would say, Rabbi Kaplan, that yeah. I think um, they got permission-ish, right? Like uh -huh. they got permission, but it wasn't like a full wholehearted permission as we know, because Pharaoh and his army ends up going after. So that's how I always put it, just for what right. it's worth. My perspective is they got permission-ish. Right. It's kind of like waking up the morning after and say, wait a second, did I, did I really do that? Right. Pharaoh wakes up. <laughs> of course, the way it's, it's positioned in, in the beginning of this week's Torah portion is that God hardens Pharaoh's heart, just as, as God had done consistently throughout each and every plague. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And here too, it was it, as if it wasn't enough for God to say, that would have been fine. But no, God has to go back and harden Pharaoh's heart Yet again, they're already out of Pharaoh's hair, and uh, there they are. And so Pharaoh has a turn of uh, change of heart, a hardening of heart, if you will, <laughs> and decides to send his armies out to pursue the the Israelites. They can't have it easy enough. They can't. They, it's not enough for them simply to to depart in mass. They have to then be followed, and you know, and and their lives threatened. Yeah. And their lives threatened on a number of fronts, of course, because on the one hand, you have um, Pharaoh and his armies kind of in the rear view mirror. And on the other hand, we know uh, from the biblical account that there is going to be uh, these individuals who've taken advantage of the Israelites in their initial journey uh, toward freedom. So right, the Amalekites, Amalek and, and his cronies, if you will, and 
they not only take advantage of the elderly, they take advantage of the infirm, they take advantage of the young, they take advantage perhaps of the um, women who um, at that time were more likely to be vulnerable. And, um, and so they do not have it easy to say the least when they're, uh, you know, kind of on the precipice of freedom, which is something I was hoping to talk to you about today, Great. this notion that we have kind of a, um, an exodus, we have this redemption, we have this major event of leaving Egypt um, toward promise, and yet it is so challenging. It's thick with um, problems and challenges on its way to all of the good that can come with freedom. Within this week's Torah portion, there are multiple times that the, the Israelites are I want to say threaten uh, on a genocidal level, on an entire nation level of death. And that starts with prior to their, cro I mean, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, prior to their crossing of the, the Red Sea. I mean, it, it happened thousands of years ago, but um, <laughs> spoiler alert in case you haven't caught up. So, um, so even before that, right at the outset, we mentioned Pharaoh changes his mind, his heart is hardened. And he sends forth his army. So the, the Israelites, the Jews, are in peril in that, in that front from, from the rear, right? So they, they could That's easily right. be, be killed out there. Then they, I mean, they make it past the Red Sea, right? So that's it's an incredible thing for the, the sea to split and for them to yeah. escape the chariots and, and Pharaoh's army. But even after, they, even after they're out in the desert, they, I, I, by the way, this is one of my favorite lines out of the book of Exodus. Um, oh, share. Do share. Which is which is this? It's so such an incredible sarcastic joke where the where the Israelites say to Moses, "Were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had yes. to bring us out here to the desert?" Almost as if to say, um, "You have mercy on the Egyptians. <laughs> they didn't oh, bother yeah. burying our bodies in their own land that we have to come out to no man's land. This will be our the place of our burial." That's which, right which is uh, definitely the source for all Jewish sarcastic jokes in the rest of Jewish history. <laughs> Which, by the way, is interesting you're mentioning this today because I um, participated um, as one of many people probably in the whole community in um, the uh, one of the first nights of the Jewish Film Festival here that's all electronic. Anyone can get a hold of this online for a few dollars. And the first film that was shown as like the precursor to the big film um, last night was um, a Jew walks into a bar, which is about an Orthodox man in New York City who takes up stand-up uh, comic, which is like fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so who knew, I, he didn't mention it last night, but I know if he had one more minute on that 24 minute <laughs> film, he would have spoken about where he got his true start to comedy, <laughs> obviously. Now, um, if you don't mind, while I'm making a joke, yeah. if I could also share um, a meaningful, uh, actually thoughtful interpretation, so I <laughs> earn my keep during this very special <laughs> podcast that I'm having a blast with, by the way, Great. I should have been Great. on the podcast. Um, is um, just this, to your point, one of my favorite um, midrashim or creative interpretations of this moment of leaving Egypt, right? So you were just speaking about all that's come before mm -hmm. and all that's in front of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an incredibly meaningful um, midrash by Rashi, um, the commentator from France, who actually says that the Israelites, our ancestors, when they were leaving Egypt and coming to the point of the Red Sea, but before it entirely opened, he imagined that they are like a dove in the cleft of a rock, which by the way, is a reference to the Song of Songs, right? Ooh. There's a dove in the cleft of the rock. So that's nice how I've like come to study this midrash. Mm -hmm. But the idea is what, is, what happens with a dove, right? The dove, it, the cleft of the rock is probably at the edge of a cave. You go back into a cave and we know that in caves are snakes, right? So that's kind of the snake is the Egyptian experience, right? Low tov, not good, very, very challenging, the days of bondage. So that's the snake. But when the dove then says, okay, I'm not going to stay in the cave. I'm going to go outside the cave. There is a hawk circling. Mm. Who's the hawk circling but this closed sea, 
right? There's nothing in front. There's no safe place to go at -hmm. that moment of leaving, but not having seen the sea part. And so what can the dove do? Again, go back, get eaten by a snake, go forward, get eaten by a hawk. But in Rashi's wisdom, he says, ah, but the dove, if calculating things just so, can sneak up like not out and not back, but like sneak up and then fly away that route. And that's like our ancient ancestors. The Israelites, they couldn't go back to Egypt, even if they thought they might have wanted to at several points later on, or they could not go forward because physically there was no way to walk through the sea because it hadn't yet been parted. But they looked up and they decided to have faith that God would bring them through this. And that's the model that I think about every day. I really do, because the Exodus is such a central story for us. This idea that sometimes we look around us in every single direction, and there is no hope or possibility that we can see with our eyes. But when we look up, when we have faith, and it can be faith in God, which I'd like to think we have. It can also be faith in um, leadership. It can be faith in um, community. It can be faith in like the the goodness and the beneficence of mitzvot, whatever that faith is, that is what can deliver us, if you will, from our moments of crisis. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. It's some good imagery. <laughs> it is. It's really, imagery. it's it's actually, it's, it's very meaningful. And actually, if you don't mind, Rabbi Kaplan, one more mind. thing, which is... Yeah. Um, uh, that actually, once upon a time, I did study a little bit of this at Cedar Village with many of you who may be participating today, like within wow. the last few years. And I recall that there was a, um, a bird that had come to like perch itself on a particular window that was outside of where we were studying, hmm. that like small dining hall with the little bar. And, um, and so people were talking actually about how much natural imagery means to them because Mm. it is something, if you really stop and pay attention to what a bird is doing every single day, you recognize small brain, but still calculating (laughs) many things. And I don't know, that was so powerful for me to realize that yes, the natural um, metaphors of our Tanakh, of our Jewish Bible are really meaningful when we come to, to embrace them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you I, think about that? Like, do you think about um, not the natural worlds per se, but at this moment, like this discussion about um, the Exodus as this like powerful metaphor for even what we're going through during like a pandemic? Is that something that's on your mind? I mean, it's not not on my mind. It's I mean, in thinking about getting out, it's hard not to think about getting out of the pandemic, getting out from under the threat of this deadly virus, and also so many people have been quarantining at home, whether it's you know, not for Cedar Village, but people out in the world have been working from home, not going into the offices, not not going to restaurants, not going and really just staying at home and literally going out and leaving. And also it's hard not to think about even just the word Egypt. What is Egypt in Hebrew? It's Mitzrayim, which is, which is this dual plural for uh, constricting spaces. So you're, you're, so it's been a constricted time where people mm. are stuck, at, whether at home, one's residence, there's, uh, it's, it's just not the same. Like even as you were mentioning, the Jewish, the Cincinnati Jewish Film Festival, it's online. It's not, we're not able to all gather together at this time. So yeah. it's been a tough time for uh, so many people in the last 10 months. And mm. it's, really exciting to look forward to when we can depart out of this constricting time for ourselves. And it's an interesting model to think about getting out what that could look like. And um, I think we're all yearning for it, especially, especially in thinking about the very particular Cedar Village context in which we get our second dose of the Pfizer vaccine this week. So it's something that that is literally an injection of hope here at Cedar Village. And, um, and something that we look forward to our departure out of this constricting time. Yeah, I really, I really, I appreciate the um, anatomy, if you will, of the term Mitzrayim. And I, I, I think about that a lot. What are the narrow places? What are the constricting places? And 
for some of us, it has been our physical home. Like it's become like a narrow wall. I, I think of um, this book I've been reading, my um, children from the PJ Library, which many of you will know uh, provides library books to Jewish families. And um, there's a book called um, Meshka the Kvetch. Do you know this book, Rabbi Kaplan? Not yet. Oh my gosh, I need to get it to you. Your children would find it phenomenal. <laughs> so Meshka the Kvetch, um, kvetches about everything. Um, she's a widow, so she kvetches that um, her husband um, who built their home that she still lives in, um, built it too small. She kvetches that her son, who's an adult son who lives with her and studies Torah all day from his room, um, that he, as she puts it, lies on his bed like a pickle with a lump on his back. <laughs> this will come and play in just one moment. And she kvetches that um, her daughter, who lives in a home just a mile away, only comes to visit her once a month mm. and wouldn't even recognize her, she says, the other 29 to 30 days. <laughs> and she fetches that her legs are like melons, like they're like, mm. they're like swollen. So kvet Meshka the Kvetch, that's already a tongue twister. If you've learned anything from today, just say that 10 times fast. That's a project. But yeah. Meshka um, complains, of course, to the rabbi, because who else is there to complain to but to the rabbi? And um, the rabbi said, well, you know, um, it's important that I'm listening and I, and that's all I can do. Like he couldn't really solve her problems. So she kind of walks away and she starts complaining really loudly again, almost to the heavens mm. and her nose starts to itch. And then the next thing she does is go to check on her son and she gets into his room and on the bed is a pickle with a lump on it. <laughs> <laughs> she like caused it to come true. Right. Uh, yeah. And then she goes to her daughter's house to tell her and the daughter said, who are you, old woman? I've never met you before. Like, I have no idea, right? Because she said, she doesn't even recognize me the days that she doesn't come visit me. <laughs> and then on the way home, her legs became melons. and She could hardly walk. Right. And then she gets to the house and it's teeny tiny, like it's a little thing. And it turns out she goes back to the rabbi and he says, oh, I heard about this before. Every time you want to fetch, offer your gratitude. Every time you think it's horrible and can't get worse, think of something that actually has been okay. It just has to be okay. And she does those things and slowly her son returns to a Talmud scholar. Her daughter recognizes her <laughs> and she even says to her daughter, gee, I'm so fortunate that you even, you, you know who I am. <laughs> and uh, the house returns to its normal size. And I thought of this at this moment, one, because I do think that when we're in a narrow place, it's easy to fetch. And I think it's okay. Like, I don't think the book ever says you shouldn't fetch. And I don't think our tradition says you shouldn't fetch. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that we also have perspective and show our gratitude. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then uh, the other piece that I raise it for is to say, gee, like we are literally in narrow places. We are literally in, um, in our smaller homes, maybe mm -hmm. to those of us, you know, who are so fortunate, we have the shelter and yet we feel like we're, we can't move around as much. And so I'm, I'm acknowledging both. And I think the Exodus teaches us that like, Hey, it's hard, right? Our ancestors complain because once they get into the desert, they don't have enough food. And they say their blessings, if you will, for the manna that falls from heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking of cons consumption, is we have, <laughs> I'm serious, they, they come and they're like, wait a second, we have no water to drink. And they come to Mara, this place Mara, which has bitter water. So it's, it's a really kvetchy place, right? They're, <laughs> they're kvetching, they're complaining, we can't drink this, this is bitter water. So Moses is able to, to sweeten the water. But then, as you mentioned, we have in chapter 16, the Israelites said, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, we ate our fill of bread. You brought us out to this wilderness to starve this whole congregation to death. So it, once again, yes, they were able to survive the Egyptian army, yet they, they're in the middle of a desert. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a forest. You can just pick whatever berries or fruits off the trees. Nothing. Yeah. There's just nothing in the desert. They expect death. Um, Although, as you mentioned, Mon comes down, which yeah. is, um, can I, you know what, can we talk about Mon? 
we probably, I was going to say, do, I think we need to go there. You can't avoid that. Right. Okay. This, uh, right. So were you going to talk about the idea that um, like the rabbinic interpreters say that it tasted like anything they wanted it to taste like, right? So I'm not going to go there. Although, <laughs> although I will <laughs> well, I say, <laughs> did. you did, you did bring it up. There is a thing in the Talmud where they, where it's mentioned as it's one sixtieth of that one that honey is one sixtieth of man, because mm. in this week's Torah portion it does describe it as like wafers with honey on it as a yeah. as a nice uh, a culinary descriptive. Uh, so there is a honey aspect to it, and the, this I mean that text comes up in the converse in the context of talking about Shabbat being one sixtieth of the world to come, fire right. being one sixtieth of Gehinom. Ma, uh, sleep being one sixtieth of death, uh, dreams being one sixtieth of prophecy, and then visiting the sick, taking away one sixtieth of their pain. Uh, is that in the same page, same text? No, but it's the same calculation, and I thought that I would. Throw uh, okay, that in. well, so the reason sixty is a very significant number for the Babylonian Talmud is because they worked off of Babylonian math, in which sixty was the most significant. In 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 American terms, we would say one out of a hundred. Right? Yes, but for Babylonians in their math, sixty was the key number. Um, although it's funny because we still have that we still have Babylonian math with us to this day. We have sixty seconds in a minute, minute that's sixty true. minutes that's in true. an hour. We still have three hundred sixty degrees in a circle, and that's mm-hmm. all of those things are based off of Babylonian math. So even though nice. um, we still retain those aspects in our present American culture, nice. Western culture. Um, but the rabbis still had this aspect for Babylonian math in, within their culture. You wanted to say that it, it could, t- right. So even though there was a specific description as, as the culinary terms go in this week's Torah portion, you're right. Rabbis in their narrative expansion and their Midrash yeah. say it tastes like, tasted like whatever you want it to taste like. But there's a reason that I bring it up. It's not just a fun fact for me, but I think again, in this like wider context of a conversation about what do we extract from um, this Parsha, like for our own lives, I think that actually part of it is a mindset, right? I'm just expanding the conversation we had a moment ago and to say, okay, um, gee, like, I don't like this food perhaps, but this is the food that I've been given. And so what can I do to get through this time period? Knowing that Mon wasn't forever, right? Just like what we're, where we are today is not forever. I truly believe that we will get beyond this difficult time period. Mm-hmm. And so I think coming up with creative ways in which to view what this time period is delivering us is actually meaningful to me. For example, um, right now, uh, I'm not going to restaurants, right? Uh, and uh, it's like really important to me. My family made a decision. And we will do, uh, like I told you today, I got a nice little kosher soup takeout from the uh, J Cafe for my lunch, uh, curbside, safe, pickup, whatever. But we are not going into restaurants. And so this is a maybe a lame example because it's not that um, thoughtful, but I think that what I really miss a lot is I actually miss sitting inside in like a restaurant and having a salad served to me and um, like a nice meal with bread and olive oil and just kind of that slow experience and someone actually bringing it to me because I don't know about you, but no one's brought me any food in the last year to my table. It's me, myself and I. And, um, and I think that it gets hard some days. And so what I've tried to do is come up with little tricks to have like a treat at home because that's something that I do miss. It's not essential, right? Mom was, I mean, food is essential. You have to eat something, right? And so I'm not making a perfect parallel here, but in my comparison, what I'm suggesting is when I've decided to make like a fun ice cream sundae bar for me and my children and my husband, if he wants to join us, um, I've I've said to myself, you know, I want to, I don't want to lose the fact that sometimes eating is actually delightful. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and I don't find a lot of delight in it when I'm eating just a regular meal at home at my table. And so um, my suggestion is that I, even the rabbis, I think, in their wise interpretation said, there's a natural desire to find delight in eating at a time where there were no choices, mm. is my interpretation of their interpretation. 
Yeah. <laughs> what else did you want to say about Mon? I'm so curious. So I thought it was here. I mean, we get a little little bit of it where God doesn't call it Mon, right? If you, if you think about what Mon is, even just what the word is, it, it's, it really is like whatness. But God doesn't call it that. I don't even think Moses calls it that. We have in chapter 16, we have in verse 14, when the fall of dew lifted there over the surface of the wilderness lay a flying, fine and flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is this? For they did not know what it is. And, and the language they use is man who. This That's is awesome. man, which is really more of a question than a, than a statement. Yes. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So he, it's, it's a bread, right? From Mo, Moses is saying, God gave it to you. Um, and then about the gathering. But eventually, uh, Mo, obviously Moses says, let no one leave it over. It's eventually, they, they call it, um, they just say it's man. <laughs> yeah. so it says the house, ultimately in, in verse 31, the house of Israel called it manna or manhu, it's, yeah. it's man, it tasted like coriander seed, white, and it tasted like wafers and honey. I find this hilarious because the Israelites are calling it what? Like they literally just like, it's some, <laughs> it's a what? When, when Moses himself tells them God gave it to you, it's bread. It is bread. God is giving it to you. Moses is really, I think, highlighting its origin, less so mm -hmm. what it is, it, yeah. and more about it's coming from god we also see in this week's torah portion yeah. this the meat that's being provided being furnished for them so they're getting meat right. in the middle of the desert and now they're getting this this delectful coriander honey wafery bread from from god rich and, desert crackers <laughs> right they're, yeah. they're getting in the middle of the desert and they're not really and moses is is really highlighting its divine origin, they're less interested where it came from, who gave That's it to right. them than what it is. What are we calling this? And you can almost hear Moses rolling his eyes and they just call it man. They, on their own, it's, it's right. about what it is rather yeah. than its provenance. And uh, I think that's frustrating to Moses because yeah. so, much, so much of this week's Torah portion is about God and his involvement, splitting the sea, uh, the provisions of food and water, mm -hmm. and yet the Israelites are really just interested on what is going on and not yeah. dying. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I remind all of those who are students of Torah is that at this moment in the Torah, the Israelites really don't know God, right? Moses has already had the privilege of getting to know God, but mm. the Israelites are really meeting God and God's wonder, if you will, at this moment. And so, of course, they're going to be almost um, dumbfounded, like the, the whatchamacallit. I mean, what, like mm -hmm. they don't even know yeah. who God is. And, and I think that, again, I, 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 I like our reminding us ourselves of that because I think that it's actually okay for us to have a an evolving relationship with God. Maybe there have been, as we're younger, we don't really know who God is. And uh, I mean, of course, Abraham Joshua Heschel will remind us we will never know who God is, right? And as will other theologians and rabbis. But but we we know God's will a little bit better as we get older and can read Torah and mitzvot. We 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 understand a little more of even our own narrative history. But I think that this is an immature stage for the Israelites, right? They are young. And that coincidence with having this, this incredible episode, right, of like the enslavement in Egypt toward freedom that's ish, mm -hmm. <laughs> freedom ish to begin with, is not different than how I also think about our young people going through, again, this pandemic, right? They're, they're immature in their lives. And so what does this mean to them? And I don't have a good answer for it. I just try to have that conversation as much as possible with my own children and with the children of our congregation to say, hey, what are you thinking about? What are your questions? How are you responding to this? Do you believe that we're gonna move through a narrow place because you can't even remember anymore what it was like before COVID? Right. Or as my son says, Corona. 
<laughs> and uh, and I and I think that the immaturity of the Israelites comes out in this man scene, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I, I like the way you described it as an immaturity. I like that. We have our final <laughs> final challenge to the the Israelites living. Right, we had the Egyptian army from behind. We had the Red Sea. We had uh, challenges of, of food and water. What, were there not enough graves in Egypt? We have to be. We have to die out here. And then the final one really is Amalek. It's a. It's an enemy that. Yeah. Uh, that's a totally new enemy that has not been part yeah. of the Israelite story. Until this week's Torah portion, in which they <laughs> confront them. Now we don't necessarily see in this week's Torah portion about. Amalek going after the weak. Uh, right. We're introduced to Amalek. Yeah. So they... Well, and, yeah. Mm, please. Oh, no. It just, the sword just comes out of nowhere in, in 17 verse 8. And they're yeah. there. And, and Moses is able to raise his hands. And they're able to uh, yeah. ultimately defeat them. So I'll remind our viewers, if you will, that... Um, the rabbinic tradition ultimately says that um, any source of evil in our world will come from the line of Amalek, that it's evil to take advantage of the downtrodden, the vulnerable, and the uh, maybe less resourceful in our midst. And so the likes of Haman, the likes of Hitler, you can probably name other individuals, I don't need to on this podcast, but um, we are so concerned about Amalek's um, evil nature that we, even when we write a Torah scroll, we blot out his name at the beginning of writing that scroll. And we blot it out as to say that evil is not going to prevail in our lives. And we're not going to forget that there are, there are glimpses of evil in our world. And we have to recall what that looks like. So we recognize it when it comes. So I think that Amalek is really significant um, for the following reason. If I could just uh, share one yes. more interpretation that really stirs me, Rabbi Kaplan, um, and I alluded to it in our pre-conversation today. Um, when I was at uh, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion here in Cincinnati, and uh, had uh, Dr. Neely Fox, who's now a professor emerita at um, the Hebrew Union College. Uh, she's a professor of um, biblical archaeology, and she brought a fascinating article to our class that really blew my theology in my mind. And it's, um, it's one of the biblical scholarly interpretations. So, um, you know, there are a lot of interpretations about um, what happened uh, in uh, this exodus. And this is just one of them to take or to leave. But she shared an article by a scholar, pardon me that I don't have the name on the tip of my tongue, who suggested that the um, Israelites may have actually been um, in wandering in the uh, bounds of Canaan and not outside. In other words, Egypt may not have been where they were entirely enslaved. And if so, the crossing they did was likely not of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds as we know it in English, but rather perhaps of a tributary or another system of water in the south of Canaan. And so this would suggest, if we take it to its natural conclusion, in my opinion, this would suggest that our ancient ancestors, the Israelites, were actually enslaved in their own land. And they became free in their own land. And I bring that to bear today because I think that there are many ways in which in our lives right now, and it's not just COVID-19, I'm now going beyond it. I'm talking about racism in America. I'm talking about um, homophobia in America. I'm talking about anti-immigrant. A lot of the, um, the, the challenges um, to our social society today and to individual people are ways in which people feel narrow, right, in their lives in this country is happening on our own land. And so I believe that when we acknowledge that, we can also say, okay, well, we can find pathways to open that narrowness and to create um, more freedoms, literally, for people in our country. Very neat. <laughs> Very neat. 
Cool. I appreciate this conversation. It's yeah. really very interesting to me and, and my closing words, and then I'd love Rabbi yeah. Kaplan for you to have your own because this is your <laughs> podcast and very meaningful to me. But my closing words would just be that I, I think we're so fortunate as Jews to have such a biblical tradition and um, metaphor for our own lives throughout them. And I'm sorry that the uh, exodus from Egypt is our story and our history. Um, and given that it exists, I say that we should actually clutch on to it at as much as we can in order to derive meaningful hope, possibility, and models for moving forward, which again, I believe wholeheartedly we will. Very neat. Very neat. Thank With God's you. help. <laughs> I, th when, I think for me, the overarching theme out of this week's Torah portion, at least what's resonating with me in 2021, is just because we get out of this really tough situation and we are able to have that departure from Egypt, it doesn't mean we're free and clear. It doesn't mean there's no other things that can threaten us or otherwise challenge right. our, our very being or existence, as we see repeatedly threats, um, both from nature and just uh, external forces. So I, th I think that's, um, I, mm. I think that's also a lesson for us that even once Psycho. we are able to emerge out of this global pandemic and the threat of this deadly virus, it doesn't mean we're, we're just going to be it's smooth sailing <laughs> afterwards. There's still a lot of work to be done in a variety of, of facets. Indeed. Indeed. So. Awesome. All right. Well, Karen, uh, Rabbi Thomas show, thank you so much. This is really things. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I really appreciated the conversation and I'd really like to thank you for hosting me at Cedar village virtually. I miss so much being there in person and you bet uh, you invite me to be the first person back and I will come. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>